Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you're here. I don't know what kind of sermon you're going to get today, but I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how good I feel. And, uh, I, just, I just feel good. God has blessed me. And uh, I haven't felt this good in a long time. I have... I am guilty of preaching conviction. I do it more than I realize I do it, and I don't think about it until somebody brings it to my attention. Because when I'm studying, I've, I've always got grace on my mind, and I've got God in my heart, and I feel close to Jesus, and I don't express that. I express the conviction to other people, and I, I, I want to apologize for that. I want to tell you that God loves you. He loves you more than, than, than anything. What does it say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8? It says that God is love. I tell you, I, I can't tell you why I picked the, the title of my sermon today because uh, there have been famous uh, people who have come down on both sides of this uh, text. That it was either Paul before conversion or Paul after conversion. And I'm not trying to convince you of either one. You, you're going to, you need to go and you need to study yourself. Because it, it took me years to arrive at my conclusion in my own heart, in my own mind, where I, who, who I think, was it Paul after conversion or before conversion? And you've got to make up your own mind. You can't take my word for it. As a matter of fact, you can't take my word for anything I say. You need to go to the book and look for yourself. I could be lying to you. I won't lie to you on purpose, I can tell you. <laughs> anyway, I, I want to talk about how, what I, how, sometimes how I view God and His awesomeness because He, God it, it is so much to me that sometimes I, 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 I I just can't explain it. It just overwhelms me. And, and two years ago, I brought part of this into one of my sermons. And this week, I decided, well, I'm going to look this stuff up. So I looked it up. Does anyone know how we measure distance in space? No? Light years. In light years, we measure distance in space. Does anyone know how fast light travels? That's pretty close, Bob. 186,000. Exactly, 186,282 miles per second. That's pretty. That's moving pretty fast. Man does, has has nothing compared that can move this fast, except for man did not. Discover light. Well, man discovered light. He invented light. But who does it really belong to? God. Yeah. What is it? the Bible says that God is light. It takes if you if you're traveling 186,000 miles per second, it takes one light year. In one light year, you can travel 5.88 trillion miles. That's one light year. We live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. There, it, our, the sphere of the Milky Way galaxy is 50,000 light years across. Can you imagine? I can't imagine 50,000 light years. That's traveling at 186,000 miles per second. You're going a trillion miles. You're going 5.88 trillion miles a year. And it takes 50 years to cross our, our galaxy. I looked this up. In National Geographic Encyclopedia of Space, it says that there are 125 billion observable galaxies. That's observable galaxies in our sphere, in our universe. There are scientists that say we have between 200 and 500 million galaxies. Can you imagine the vastness of our universe? 
It's like we can't even comprehend the vastness of God. There's just no way. Some scientists say that it just goes on and on and on and on and on. There's no end to it. I don't know about that. But uh, they, they say that the universe is ever expanding. I'm not sure about that either. But uh, I, I, I'm just trying to give you a comparison of, of, of us. Now, if you looked at a map of New Smyrna Beach, Florida, uh, you know, one of these big fold-out maps of New Smyrna Beach, Florida, you could put one speck, one little dot on that paper, and that could represent you. Now, if you take New Smyrna Beach, Florida, and you, and you uh, look at it in the sphere of the globe, our Earth, New Smyrna Beach, Florida <laughs> would be a, like a dot on, on, that, on this globe. Well, if you took our Earth in our solar system, that's not in our galaxy. Only the things that revolve around our sun, and you took our Earth, we would be a dot in our solar system. If you took our solar system and you put it in our galaxy, we would be another dot in our galaxy, our whole solar system. And then our solar system, I mean our galaxy, would be like another dot in all the other galaxies. You see how what a, a minute speck we are? And God loves us. Every one of us. That is like, how can such a being exist that has so much love? I, 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 I think about that and I, and I dwell on it because I just think, oh, what's this all about? What's it all about? The Bible tells us that God is love. That's 1 John 4, verse 8 and 16. When we say that God is love, that's not one of His attributes. That's one of His, uh, that, that is who He is. His attributes would be like His wrath, or His mercy, or His kindness, or His holiness. That's, those are His attributes. All those, all those attributes of God stem from this love. That's like, yeah. anyway, contemplate these things when you're, when you're alone and you're talking to God. When you're reading His Word. How, how he got how, how all this all this all this talk about all these galaxies and everything he, oh, I mean when you think about his word to us it's, oh, I, I mean I don't even have words for it, how excited I am when I, when I think about God and how much he loves us he tells us right here and he shows us first Corinthians chapter 13. We call that the love chapter. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I like to do this once in a while. I have it on my wall at home. I should read it more. Especially when I'm dealing with my granddaughter sometimes. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I know it's in here. If you, uh, I like to, to read it like this sometimes. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not God, I substitute that love in God. That agape is what this love is. It's God. I have become a sounding brass or a clinging symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, just think, if I knew this whole Bible from cover to cover and didn't know the author of it, that would just be like this big waste. And all knowledge... And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. What does Jesus say to the people that run up to him and say, didn't we do all these miracles in your name? And Jesus very sadly, brokenheartedly says, depart from me, for I never knew you. I know he says it with a broken heart because he loves every human being that's ever came in existence. <coughs> So, what is the problem? I'm asking myself that. You can ask yourself that. What is the problem? Adam was the first human being in the stream of human history. <coughs> You know, I didn't know how to 
say this any other way. The human race is, to me, I, I, I see it as, as an organism. <laughs> that sounds kind of strange, but God invented, you know, I should say God, God made Adam. And if you look at this word, it says in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, I believe it says, let us make man in our image. That word man means mankind. And if you look at that word a little bit closer, and you go over to, to, to uh, where it starts talking about Adam in I believe it's Genesis chapter. I can't remember what verse it is, but Adam also means mankind. The genetic code was in Adam for the whole human race. The same as a genetic code for one apple seed is the genetic code for an apple orchard. God had the whole human race in Adam. The whole human race. If you read Romans chapter 5, verse 18, and to me, it, it, it speaks volumes to me. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. I have to say, I appreciate that verse very much. It says, Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men. All men came judgment by what man? Who was that one man? Adam. Adam. This, on, this is on a side note. I, 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 I love the way God has... I, I love everything about God. I can't think. He, he made heaven and earth Let's go to the to, let's read the commandment of God in uh, Exodus chapter twenty. Let's go to verse eleven, and this is free, no charge for this. I, I just love it because it, if you if you, you read right through this, and, and we're talking about the Sabbath in our Sabbath school today. I don't, I'm not sure what the other Sabbath school talked about, but this, we studied the Sabbath today, and it says. Verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in, in them is, and rested the seventh day. Now, did it say He made everything on, this, uh, on the days one through six? All that in them is? And why did He rest? To sanctify, to show... It was a memorial. Did it complete? So, what did God make after the after the seventh day? I thought that was really interesting. So God makes Adam, and He can see through down through the portals of time, and He can see every one of us. He even knows the number of hairs on our head. And I'm getting fewer and fewer. <laughs> anyway. Now, moving along, I could, I, could, I could dwell on that for more, but I'm not. It's, uh, the fourth commandment is what we just read. And the Sabbath stands as a sign of a completed work. God has sanctified this day. And God sanctifies us the same way. If, if God, God is in the Sabbath, that's what sanctifies the Sabbath. God is in us. That's what sanctifies us. So, Adam, in the stream of humanity, he was perfect. His nature was perfect. He pleased God in everything he did. So what happened? Eve was deceived. 1 Timothy chapter 2, I think that's verse 15. It 
says Eve was deceived. But Adam, what did Adam do? Deliberate. Deliberately sinned against God. Adam went from being God dependent to being self dependent. Ever since God has been trying to find a people whom he can bless. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. I've talked about this verse. So Y'all probably, yeah, I'm blue in the face, but I still love it. I love this verse. Because it says that God, He says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. He wants to make us a special treasure. And we have, um, we have been passed down this condemnation from Adam. Adam went from being God-dependent to self-dependent. He, he went from a perfect nature to a carnal nature, which that is... The, the title of our sermon today. Spiritual or carnal? Adam went from a spiritual man to a carnal man. Now, how do we get out of this? I know, I, I see how we got into it because Adam sin against God. So that condemnation is passed down to each one of us. Now to bridge this gap, this is where I've had trouble this week trying to bridge this gap to get over through, my, through the real part of my sermon. Romans, let's go back to Romans 5.18. Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men. That was Adam brought sin to the, to the human race. Resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act. Who's that one man? Jesus. The free gift came to how many men? All. Resulting in justification of life. So we, we have this stream that began with Adam. And what God has done at the Incarnation, when Jesus Christ was born of, was, um, I can't even think how to say that. When he was, I guess, inserted into Mary, that's something I could think of. When he was put into Mary, that's the Incarnation that, that divinity was put into humanity. In the stream of, of time, Adam started. Jesus was inserted into the stream. And it changed the stream, past, present, and future. It justified every human being. But does that mean that every human being is going to be saved? No. No. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe. So what should we do? What does Romans 5.18 say? I mean, what does John 3.16 say? So before this belief, our carnal nature, our mind, let's go to uh, Romans 7.25. That's our uh, text for today. Our text is, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I'm going to back up a couple of verses.
Verse 19. Let's go back to verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not. But the evil I will, I will to do, that I practice. So I, I am doing something that I will not to do. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. When we, before we come to the belief, our carnal natures and our minds are in the same sin. They are together. They're in cahoots. They're, they're going down the path to H.E. Uh, double hockey, hockey sticks, I say. And then, if you read in uh, Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So we hear this voice. We feel Jesus knocking on the door. For our minds and our carnal natures are going the wrong way. Our mind hears the voice of God. And it changes. That's what we call repentance. It's a change of mind, a change of direction. So our minds change direction, but this carnal nature is still there going, uh -uh. no, that's what new believers have a difficult time because they want to do good and they're doing good and they're doing good and they're doing good and all of a sudden this carnal nature, it's like, it's like holding this book up. The law of gravity and the law of my will. It's not the law of my will. My will is not a law. But the law of gravity is a law. I can hold this Bible up for quite a, a little while, but pretty soon it's going to start. It's going to bring me down. The carnal nature is that way with the mind. If you're not hooked up with Jesus Christ, your carnal nature will, con will control your mind as, as time goes on. That is why you... You do what you don't want to do, and you find yourself doing the things that, of course, that you don't want to do. Because we have separated ourselves from our God. And that's the gift that has been passed along from Adam. We have separated ourselves from our God. So, how do we get back? 